okay? That's a very interesting form. Let me, um, uh, before I tell you what form that is, let me teach you what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are, okay? So we'll come back to this, okay? And this is just a little side note of linear algebra for those of you that don't know what eigenvectors and eigenvalues are. And, and by the way, these are in textbooks, these are online, uh, they're, they're easy to understand, okay? Um, so say you have a matrix that is an M by M matrix, so it's a square matrix that has as many rows as columns, okay? If you times that matrix A by a vector and you get the same vector but times by some scalar value, Right? then you have found that matrix's eigenvector and its corresponding eigenvalue, which is lambda there, the scalar that multiplied it. Okay? That's just the definition. You take a vector, multiply it by a matrix, and you get the same vector multiplied by some scalar value. That is the eigenvector, and this is the eigen, its corresponding eigenvalue. Okay? okay, well, if I have a matrix A, M by M, how do I find those eigenvectors and eigenvalues? Well, let's just use this definition of what they are. If we subtract this from this side, you know, you could, you could times this by any identity matrix by x. Here, we could have said lambda identity matrix times x. That would be the same thing, right? And then subtract it from both sides. You can see this, and now this equals 0, okay? Well, um, what you could do is if you found the determinant you, you would know that this, this equation will be true as long as the determinant of this equals zero. Okay, so this is a, this is a matrix with unknowns in it now. So, so say we don't know what x is, we don't know what lambda is. Now we have this matrix, and we took all the diagonal components and subtracted them from lambda, and we say that times x equals a, a zero vector, right? Well, um, okay, it, you know, if you... If the determinant, if, if everything in that matrix, if you plugged in lambda values that made the, the, you know, every vector in that matrix independent, then you could find a determinant that's non-zero, and you could just invert it, and that means this would have to be zero. It would be a trivial case, right? But what you want to do is if you set the determinant equal to zero, and you use that equation, look up what a determinant of the matrix is. You can calculate it. It's basically kind of a, a um, representative scalar number for a matrix, right? You know, um, and, and but if you can set that equal to zero, it's like it's like you kind of make this matrix representatively zero. Then this can be this can be a non-zero, non-trivial value, okay? And, and so and, and if you can find a thing where this is the determinant is zero, then this matrix can't be inverted, and this has to be a non-trivial value, and those vectors in that thing are dependent, and, and you can find a way to make this zero with a non-trivial value. So that, that's why you want the determinant equals zero. If what I've said is just completely confused, you don't, don't worry about it. It's just linear algebra. You can just trust me on this one, and you don't need to understand this for this, this course. I just want you to understand uh, the math. But this is going to come down to, uh, you can just use a MATLAB tool to find the eigenvectors, eigenvalues, and you're done, whether you understand what they are or not. But I, I do want you to understand it. So, so um, uh, you know, but if you're freaking out right now, don't worry, you're not going to be tested on this. You're not going to need to know it for a homework. Um, this is just a supplementary, uh, nice to know stuff. Okay, so if you take this matrix, you're trying to find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, you subtract all of its diagonal components from some scalar lambda, you take the determinant of it, set it equal to zero, and thereby solve all those lambdas. Okay, and by the way, if it's an M by M matrix, you'll find M solutions, so you'll find M different lambdas that make the determinant equal to zero, then what you do is you plug those lambdas in, right, to this, to this matrix. You take the matrix, subtract every diagonal from each of those lambdas, and for each of those, you, you find their corresponding uh, x vector, which you can do by finding the null space, right? And so what you'll get is you'll get, uh, you know, a, a you know, say you plug in one of the M solutions here, and then you solve this and you find its corresponding vector. Well, now you have the vector that's the eigenvector, and now you have the corresponding eigenvalue lambda. So if you have an A M by M matrix, or just an M by M matrix, you will find M eigenvalues and M corresponding eigenvectors that satisfy this equation, okay? Um, 
Okay, so, so that, that's really all you need to know. If you have a matrix, square matrix that's m by m in size, uh, you will, you will, it, will, it will have m eigenvalues that correspond with m eigenvectors. And, and the definition of eigenvectors and values is in this single line here, okay? Okay, that's really all, all you need to know. So you, all those extra things and this whole thing you didn't need to understand, okay? Nice if you do, though, okay? But let's go back to this equation here. You might see a similarity in this. Remember, what we did is we took Newton's equation, we set it equal to zero, and we, we plugged in a guess um, that would satisfy this, just like we did in the previous proof. And we're trying to find the condition that would make this be satisfied for no load and therefore find its natural frequencies in the corresponding mode shapes. Well, we got this equation, and you might see, oh wow, this looks pretty similar to this equation we just found. And, and I'm just going to look at these two key ones. So you can see, uh, if you take mtw inverse times ktw, that is essentially a 6 by 6 A matrix. It's like A 6 by 6. And T is a 6 by 1 vector that's essentially the X here. And omega squared is essentially a scalar value of the lambda. Okay? So if you now go into MATLAB, if, 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 so I've taught you how to find a stiffness matrix, and I've taught you how to find a mass matrix. Okay? If you now go into MATLAB, invert that mass matrix, okay, times it by the stiffness matrix, and then say, I want to find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of that 6 by 6 resulting matrix, it will spit out for you 6 eigenvectors, which correspond to the 6 mode shapes, and 6 corresponding eigenvalues, which if you square root them, equals uh, the natural frequencies corresponding to those mode shapes. Okay, uh, a couple insights here. Remember in one-dimensional land, okay, it was square root of k divided by m was the natural frequency, and there was no, there was only one mode shape you could do, it could only vibrate in one direction, okay, so there's only one natural frequency, but of course that's nonsense, there's not a one-dimensional system in, in the entire universe, because we're a three-dimensional uh, universe, right, that we experience anyway, and, um, but in, in, uh, in three-dimensional land, okay, in three-dimensional land, um, you're going to get, if, if, with our assumption that all the mass is in the stage and all the stiffness is in the flexures, that is idealized to some degree, you're going to get six natural frequencies, uh, sorry, six eigenvectors that are twists that, that tell you the six ways this could move, okay, and then it will be six, uh, you know, eigenvalues that you have to square root to find the natural frequencies that correspond with those mode shapes. And so, so look at this. Remember in uh, one dimensional line it was square root k over m. Well is this not k? So this is, this is already inverse of m, so you can think of this as like 1 over m. So this is k divided by m, and then you square root it, okay, to find the natural frequency. So, so you can see in three dimensional land this is essentially square root k over m where you have m inverse times k, that's k over m, and then the nat natural frequency is, is omega squared, so you have to square root it. Okay, so you, hopefully you can see the beauty here of, of jumping from one dimension to three dimensions and how this math works. So first of all, you're going to get, for a parallel system with our assumptions, six natural frequencies corresponding with six um, uh, twist mode shapes or eigenvectors. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's find the natural frequencies of this. Um, and by the way, you might be disturbed to say, but well, wait, I thought most anything in three dimensions has infinite natural frequencies and infinite mode shapes, and you're right, but not if you assume all the mass is in a stage that's infinitely rigid and all of the compliance is in the elements uh, with no mass in those elements, okay? Um, that's where you just get six, okay? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But let's, let's first do... Our example here, so say we want to calculate the six mode shapes and their corresponding natural frequencies of this parallel flexure system. Remember this was the ongoing example of this entire lecture. I gave you all the geometries, all the topology, all the, all the numbers. I gave you all the material properties, and the density, you know, we said it's made of aluminum. And through it we, we were able to calculate 
the stiffness matrix, assuming all the compliance, it's a six by six matrix, assuming all the compliance is in the wires and assuming all the mass is in the stage, we found the mass matrix, okay? And, and so now what we're going to do is you're going to take, you're going to invert this mass matrix, times it by K, and if you plug it in this form in MATLAB, take in M, and by the way, that's not the most accurate way to do an inverse. You could do M kind of a backslash is kind of a better way to do it. But you just look up MATLAB help. Um, in M will work. It's just not as good as M backslash. Um, but anyway, just invert the mass matrix, times it by your K matrix, and then plug it in a function called eig, and it will spit out, and, and do this, it'll spit out its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And because this is a six by six matrix, what you'll get is the eigenvectors will show you, it will also be a six by six matrix, where this is the first twist, second twist, third twist, fourth twist, fifth twist, sixth twist, and notice twists are all six by one vectors, okay? So it'll, these are the six eigenvectors, and then it will spit back a matrix called eigenvalues. So remember, here's eigenvectors, here's eigenvalues, where it will be a diagonal matrix, um, also six by six, where it's all zero, but the diagonal components will be these, where each of the first one corresponds to that eigenvector, the second eigenvalue corresponds to that eigenvector, and so on and so forth. And the most common mistake, do not, do not, do not, forget to square root these values because these eigenvalues equal the natural frequency squared, so you have to square root them, okay? So after you've done this and it spits out these two things and you've square rooted the eigenvalues, you'll get this and these are now the natural frequencies, okay? So let's get rid of, so we're gonna keep this because these are the, the mode shapes apparently in twist land and these are apparently the uh, natural frequencies because we've square rooted them, so let's move it up Okay, and let's look, You'll, you will see right off the bat, of the six natural frequencies it provided for our example, three of them are substantially lower than the others. So the, the, two of them are 44 radians per second essentially, and another one's 115 radians per second, which you're like, well, that's, that's much bigger. But, but then it's like, wow, the other ones are like over 2,000 radians per second. So it's like there's a clear break between low natural frequencies and high natural frequencies corresponding to constrained directions, right? Well, you'll notice uh, this one corresponds to that one, this one corresponds to that one, this one corresponds to that one, just by the order that MATLAB gave it to you, okay? Remember, natural eigenvalues, even square rooted, correspond to eigenvectors, uh, okay? Uh, and those are the corresponding ones. So let's let's uh, take these eigen these twist eigen vectors, which are mode shapes, okay, and let's um, let's uh, decompose them to visualize them, okay. So imagine this is a displacement twist. It's in displacement twist uh, units, okay. So let's if we take this this twist and you decompose it using what I taught you in lecture two, you'll find a C vector is this that's viable, of course, there's infinite C vectors, but this is one of them. And you'll find the omega vector, delta theta, because it's a displacement twist, is this, and you'll find the pitch is zero. So it's a rotation. Do this one, you find this here, and you do this one, you find this here. Okay, so, so do this at home. You know, put me on pause. Prove to yourself that if you decompose these, these three twists, you get these things, okay? But now let's, since, why did we decompose them? To see what they look like. Okay, so let's, and by the way, let's let's remember this is 44, that's 44, that's 115. Put them down there and we're gonna put 44 here, 44 here, 115 here. Okay, so let's let's look at this. According to the global coordinate system, the location vector or a location vector was 0, 0, negative 357 meters. And notice this is just 30 meters tall. So we're talking way down. Okay, and then we're talking a direction that is in the x-axis, some negative value, zero, zero, um, and it's a pitch of zero. So it's a red rotation that is parallel to the x-axis, but way far down. And you can imagine that rotation is basically manifesting, because it's so far away, as a translation in the y direction. Okay? And if, so it's like, okay, and that, that corresponds, you know, if we, if we animate that mode shape, it would look like that. It basically looks like it's translating in the y direction, but it's really actually rotating around an axis that's super far away, okay? And, and so that is 
that is the mode shape. And, and by the way, if we did FEA uh, and we did modal analysis, it would, it would animate that. That's actually where I got this animation from. But uh, using our mass and stiffness matrix in MATLAB to find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues and looking at what the lowest natural frequencies are and looking at their corresponding eigenvalues decomposed, we can see that we're dead on here, okay? And then you notice this one is the same, it's zero, zero, negative, it's super far down, except now this is in the y direction, okay? And, and, and since it's so far away, it's a rotation, this corresponds to a translation in the x direction. And then this one is zero, 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 it's a location vector that's just right there, and it goes zero, zero, one up in the z-axis, and it's also a zero pitch. And this one corresponds 115 for 116 radians per second, right? And it's a pure rotation right through its center. Okay, so so a couple things to note. So so one, that's really cool, is, is, the, is that, uh, you know, by finding the mass and, and stiffness matrix we found, and inverting the mass times the mass stiffness matrix and finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, square rooting the eigenvalues, you can now find uh, the, if you look at what the smallest natural frequencies are, you can find their corresponding mode shapes, and you could animate them yourself using our math, understanding how twists work, okay? And, and, and you could know what their natural frequencies are, okay? And, and notice, if we had taken these other eigenvectors that, that corresponded to very stiff natural frequencies, we're talking you know, almost 3,000 radians uh, per second, that's a very high natural frequency. Uh, that, you know, the square root of K over M, that means its K is really stiff and its mass is really low. Ba basically, you, know, you can kind of think of it like that. Th that corresponds to constrained directions. And if you decompose these, you would find um, you know, that, that it would force those wires to stretch in ways they would not want to stretch to move in those ways. So that's why there are such high natural frequencies and, and they, are, they correspond to the constrained degrees of freedom or the degrees of constraint. Okay, so um, in this case it's very nice. There's a clear cut between very high natural frequencies and very low natural frequencies that correspond to mode shapes that are the degrees of freedom. Okay, these are the these are the ways that the flexures can very comfortably, with low com with high compliance, deform, uh, and, and will naturally do so when they're excited. Okay, um, by in, any uh, in vibration. Okay. All right. The other thing that's interesting is is you'll note that um, according to our theory, the first two natural frequencies were identical, literally for 44.02 radians per second. Um, okay. That is, um, that is because, um, oh here, uh, I need to actually switch my battery out here. 